Hello and welcome the first in the series of our program, The Evolution of a Nation, a brand new documentary series chronicling Uganda's key political, social and economic history. I'm Bart Kakoza. As you may already be aware, on the 9th October this year, Uganda will be celebrating 50 years of independence. As part of many activities to mark the Golden Jubilee, we decided to rewind back into history reflect on and document key political, social, and economic events through which the country has evolved to get to where it is today. It is against this background, therefore, that we decided to name this series The Evolution of a Nation. Now, like any other country in the world, Uganda's history is very wide and hence it is not possible to include each and every aspect of this rich and diverse history. That's why in this series, we identified and focused on key ones. You will definitely find some that have not been included, but this does not make them less important. The series covered the period from 1944 to date. We decided to stretch back from that time simply because it was the year when the British colonialists marked 50 years of occupation of Uganda, and each series covered a specific period in the country's history. So, lay back and relax as we bring you the first episode in the series. This is Kampala in the late 1880s, the area that was later to develop not only into a permanent administrative seat of the powerful Uganda Kingdom, but also the capital of Uganda. This is Kawaka Mutesa I, a powerful Buganda monarch to first get into contact with the Europeans in 1862 at his palace in Nabulagala. The historic meeting that was later to form the basis of the country today known as Uganda. By 1800, the tribal groups in the country we now call Uganda was fairly cut off from the outside world. The name reflects the idea of the first explorers whose gateway into the new territory was via the Buganda tribe, whom they were later to use as their colonial agents as British rule was extended. Although they were impressed by the sophistication of Buganda society, they implicitly assumed that Africa was more backward than Europe that Africans would benefit from exposure to Western standards and practices, and of course Christianity. To some extent, this allowed them either to justify or even to suppress what now looks to be the crude reality that their underlying agenda was the extension of British influence without reference to the actual wishes of Ugandan people. In June 1894, Uganda was formally declared a British protectorate, this meant that Uganda became a British territory which was not formally annexed, but in which by treaty, grants or other lawful means, the crown had powers and jurisdiction. Besides, Britain also provided defense and controlled external relations. In other words, a state controlled by Britain was created. Mwam Siandevesa is a historian and lecturer in the Department of History at Makere University. He has studied and researched extensively about Uganda's history. So the state of Uganda was created in 1894. But the nation of Uganda was never there. And the process, the evolution of this nation, I think, is a process that started in the 1940s. From 1894, we do have a state that is not properly and identified with the people. There is no proper linkage between the state and the people because it was a colonial state. Ugandans were subjects, they were not citizens because citizenship is not merely 
the question of having rights of belonging, citizenship also implies this, the populace actively participating in public affairs. And you see this one beginning in the 1940s. In 1944, the British celebrated 50 years of Uganda protectorate. The 50 years had not been very easy for the British. Besides the task of setting up administrative structures, spreading their control to the rest of the country and establishing revenue sources, the colonialists had been preoccupied with the task of containing internal strife in Winyoro and Buganda as well as stopping the religious wars. The British celebrated it, hoping that actually it was just a one event in many events where they would still be in Uganda. They never expected to go away as they did in 1962. Therefore, 19, 50, uh, 1944 was a wake-up call to the Africans that actually the colonial British were here to stay even longer and therefore something had to be done from that time. During the Second World War, the colonial administration recruited 77,131 Ugandans to serve in the nine infantry units, and they made many important contributions to war efforts. They served in the outside Africa and saw actions such as in occupation of Madagascar and the reconquest of Burma from Japanese. They helped defeat the Italians in Ethiopia and worked as part of the military labor force in Egypt and the Middle East. This exposure later acted as a catalyst to their agitation for the self-rule when they returned home. Aloysius Darlington Luboa, popularly known as Eddie Luboa, former justice minister in the Kawaka Mutesa II government, was 16 years old when the ex-service men returned. He curiously listened to their war stories, from which he concluded that the exposure was the initial trigger. The active participation of the Ugandan young men in the war was kind of an eye opener. So when they went to war, they fought together with the, the British. Here before they went to the war, they thought the British were very different people. But when they started living with them, eating with them, and uh, even calling themselves, calling them names, yeah. then they they, they, they got uh, said, look, I think we can also, without these people, we can rule, rule ourselves. And there are these people say, ah, you see, these Europeans are brave. Eh? When they were doing the war, they could melt like, uh, like, uh, like a ghee or, or <laughs> on the equator. Eh? And, but we put up good fights, so this got encouraged. People like Jolly Joe and many others had gained a lot of experience Eh? Yeah, yes. So when they came back, they also started agitating for independence. Africans had woken up because of the experience that our the, the Af Af Africans who served in the British Army got new ideas and knew that people had to struggle for independence. The centralized and the centralized administrative political systems facilitated British economic policy. Uganda would develop primary products such as cotton, coffee, sugar, rubber, and tea in order to meet the needs of the mother country. The introduction of export crops was done at the expense of local industries as new taxation policies were developed to ensure that small-scale entrepreneurs were appropriately discouraged. The British systematically undermined African industries while encouraging European and Asian immigration participation. While Buganda were occupied with land ownership and administration, Asians became involved in commerce, retail and wholesale trade, cotton ginning, coffee and sugar processing. By the late 1940s, the banks were British or Indian-based. Banks rarely lent to Africans, although they accumulated African savings. Africans were largely excluded from wholesale trade as according to colonial policy, licenses could only be issued to traders who owned permanent buildings of stone concrete. This colonial policy provoked intense resentments. Africans felt alienated and for a long time regarded Asians as foreigners and exploiters. 
this state of affairs angered African farmers. Africans learned that in order to get self-rule or self-determination, they had to organize. Therefore, you find from that time organizations such as the Uganda African Farmers Union and the Bataka Union and many others were formed to agitate and demand for one, economic justice and two, political justice and even democratic processes to begin. Their aim was not initially independence as such. They were concerned that uh, the Asians at that time dominated much of the economy. So the Bataka felt that time would come when the local people in Uganda and Buganda should participate and uh, gin their cotton and market it outside and also gin their coffee and market it outside. That's how things began. Popularly referred to as the father of Uganda's nationalism, Ignatius Musazi was one of the many offsprings of Buganda gentry, a class of the thousand privileged Buganda that had benefited from the land distribution following the 1900 agreement. No doubt, he received the best education of the time, including studying at reputable public schools in Britain, where he interacted with children of lords. At the end of his course, he chose to become an Anglican clergyman. When they finished their course, his friends were ordained. And for him, he says, as you are coming from Uganda, you will be ordained by the Church of Uganda. He came back unordained. He went to the Bishop of Uganda. And he says, I have finished all my course. I want to serve the church. So do the necessary, ordain me. He says, hello, don't you know that you are an African? You go to Mukono and become a catechist, an African catechist. So Musazi was felt very offended. And he, he threw his collar down and said bye-bye. So he went to, to teach at Budo. And he did his job very well. Then he was uh, promoted to be an inspector of schools. So he used to be given a motorcycle to go around to inspect and enforce the syllabus in different schools. One day, when he was coming from Toro, a leopard jumped, and instead of jumping on him, he just missed him. So he drove fast, and I came and reported to his boss. He said, I, I was almost killed by a leopard. But you, as you are always staying here, and for me, I'm going in the wild. Let me, you stay with the motorcycle. And for me, I, I take the, 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 the vehicle. He said, don't you know that you are an African? I'm the only one who is entitled to have. So he said, huh, is that all? So he also abandoned teaching, the uh, inspector, inspectorate. Now, he went to, 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 to Masulita, uh, organized a, a, an association of vegetable growers. Every, every morning, they could pack his, their vegetables on his, on his uh, uh, motorcycle and bring them to Nakasero and sell. Then he saw a number of things. The Africans used to carry milk to the Indian and he knocks on the doors. Hey, now, by this time, when the, these Africans have been moving and the milk is about to go sour, they say, Aya, later, eh? Chukwa Sumoni. That's 50 cents. And the, the poor man who had uh, struggling all the time from door to door and nobody's buying. So is that kind of okay, bring? So Musazi was tickled. Then he also found that by then there were no this uh, modern sewer, sewerage system. But there used to be a, a toilet with a bucket below. Then in the evening, there were people who were tourers, tourers who were supposed to do what? To, 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 to collect it and take it away. These people were being paid three shillings. No sanitary wear. No, no, no anything. He says, no, this is too much. So he organized the milk vendors. He organized the chulas and made them into a trade union. He was reinforced with the people from the Second World War. Every evening he used to go to, to Kampala Mukade, rings the bell. The people, when they leave work, they go and listen to him. They go and listen to him. 
the crowd continued grew, swelling. The Brits became nervous until the governor passed a law that nobody is allowed to have an, an audience of 70 people unless it is given to him in person in writing. So, Masazi, you know what I did? I said, I never invite these people. I only ring the bell and they come. Do they have my invitation? So he continued. When it was becoming too much, they arrested Masazi, put him into, into court, jailed him for, for three years. Now, when he came back, so he organized a demonstration where the Bank of Uganda is, so where the central police station was. The British were very much jittered. They arrested him. They began shooting, and they killed one, one chura by the name of Peter Raheru. He was again arrested with others for another three years. When he came back, he said, uh -uh. the best way is now these people are exploiting us. We grow cotton, we grow coffee, we are not allowed to, to process, eh, to buy and process and also export what we grow. They pass it through Indians, they cheat us. Uh, no, we are not. So he began the Uganda Farmers, uh, Farmers Union. Eh? He, had, he was given a lot of, 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 of headache. Then he moved all over Uganda, recruited people. Eh? And uh, he had a very good response because the, he, was, he was touching the people's interests. Musazi realized that in order to create impact for his organization, there was urgent need to lobby for support in Britain. He sought to use his former college mates, most of whom by then had become prominent politicians and powerful opinion leaders. But the union, as an organization, had not earmarked the funds for the project. So they collected 20 cents all over Uganda from each member, and they bought him a ticket to go to Britain. When he was there, he says, do you know, you also put there, make sure that you also put up some demonstration. To, to give to highlight our, our demands, they had uh, what they called cotton holdups. That is, they would not sell their cotton until they demand, their demands were met. The demonstrators targeted the Kabaka and local chiefs who acted on behalf of the colonial government. This time, they moved to the Ruviri because the only place where they could express their views was to the the, the chief agents of colonialism. That was the Mango of uh, Mango government. They gathered at uh, now called the Kabaka's Lake, where they spent the night, previous night. And the following day, it was a Monday morning, they marched up to the, the Rubiri, the front area of the Rubiri. The petition which the rioters' delegates presented to Kabaka read thus, Your Highness should open the rule of democracy to start giving the people power to choose their own chiefs. We want the number of 60 unofficial representatives in the Luchiko to be completed. We demand the abolition of the present Buganda government. We want to gin our own cotton. We want to sell our own produce in the outside countries. Uh, the, the Kabak had asked them to, to send a small delegation. He met them and uh, after discussing their grievances, their demands, she gave them answers, but these answers were not satisfactory to them. And so they came out, they announced to the big crowd outside that Kabaka had said this, that, and the other, and they started rioting, burning houses, uh, beating people, and uh, it was really riotous. Some threw even some stones at the, the, the pallet because they demanded, they wanted these things, and the Kabaka would delay darling. I remember at that time I was, a, I was a journalist, then I had started journalism. I worked under a man called J.W. Kiwanuka, who is now popular known as Jule Jo. He was the editor of a newspaper called Matalisi. Matalisi used to be published by some white men. And their, their printing presses were, 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 now you see, King Fad Plaza building. Those were the premises, the offices and printing press. He didn't have kind words with the Bataka. He didn't like them, the way they were behaving. So he, he wrote very critical articles about them. 
his main job was to ridicule what Musazi was doing and make, make fun of what the African demands. Yeah. So he was not a nationalist? Not at all, not at all. Interestingly, right from his youthful days, Jolly Joe had vividly exhibited strong spirit of nationalism and patriotism. After leaving Makere University College, he got a job at the Lands and Service Department in Entebbe as a surveyor. It is there that the rebel in him manifested. While he was there, they did not allow the Africans to, to use telephones, you know. Eh? The, 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 the telephones were used by Bazungu. But Jolly Joe found that terrible. He could not accept it. And one time he got hold of a telephone. He rang a friend in Entebbe or somewhere around, and he talked in Uganda. Then his boss, Mzungu, found him talking. He stood in front of him, I hoping that Kiwanuka would now abandon the, the call. But Jole Joe went. He even shouted more, and he even turned his back against this Mzungu, and he continued talking. Eventually, he pursued it. when he finished, he, he put it down, down, boom, you know. Uh, uh, yes, very forcefully. Yeah. Then he he turned to this Muzungu and he, uh, he told him in Luganda, <laughs> Is this telephone you are denying us, your mothers? <laughs> so that was Jory Joe. Eventually he left. When he left the, 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 the survey, I perhaps department, he went to, for, for, we joined the Second World War, and he served uh, in the Middle East and so on. But when he came out, he was a, at, a, at the rank of a sergeant major. When he came, he comes, he becomes the editor of Uganda Herald. Okay. And at that time, I don't know what made him change his mind. At that time, the Uganda Herald was supporting the uh, uh, British uh, colonial policies. And Jolie Joe becomes editor. When he became editor, he was on the side of the colonies, I mean policy. He followed because colonial policy. Now, when they started rioting, they went for him because she was not favorable to them in the, uh, in the articles he was writing. So they went to him, they, they went for him, they attacked his house, which was in Rubaga, burned it down and as he was coming from the office to to see what was happening at home they got him in, on the way and beat him up almost up to death he was he was hunted by the by, by the, the people, the people. Yeah. Mm. and they got him and they beat him and left him for dead in fact they had come to, to collect they had gone to collect petrol to pour on him so that they burn him Somehow, he miraculously survived. During that time, the British were also conspiring. <clears throat> they moved the battalions all over East Africa, and at about three, they surrounded all of them. They began shooting. This is the first time I saw that there was, there was another force in Uganda that ruled over us. At that time, I knew we were under the Kabaka of Buganda, and the protectorate government was there to protect, as the word seemed to say. But now here, these protectors came all the way from Kenya, under the name KAR, and we are running all over the country, arresting every peasant who was suspected to be part of the riots. So, during that time, a number of... Uh, Leaders and imagined leaders were arrested, including Father Sparta of Namungona. Eh? They were all sentenced to six years. My uncle, Semione Kintu, was arrested. He was taken in, sentenced to 80 years, which he fully served together with others. Both the Bataka and African farmers' parties were banned. Although Musazi was in London during the riots, the colonialists blamed the uprising on him and was banned from returning to Uganda. The governor said he's banned from coming back. Musazi retorted. He says you are joking. That's not your land. 
the better thing is for you to come back to your land and for me also to come back to my land. You, you cannot give me dictation. Well, this marks the end of the first episode in our series, The Evolution of a Nation, a documentary series that chronicles key events in Uganda's history from 1944 to date. In our next episode, we shall look at the founding of Uganda National Congress, UNC, in 1952, Uganda's first legally registered and recognized and colonial political party by Musazi after serving his three-year sentence in jail. Who are the founding members? What prompted its formation and its early activities? We shall also look at the exiling of the Kabaka to Britain for two years, the period which was later to be referred to as the Kabaka Crisis. Thanks for taking time to be part of our wider audience. My name is Bart Kakoza. See you next time. <laughs>